Hi, and welcome to our second set of videos in our uh, series on building a simple electronic structure program in, uh, in MATLAB. And in this set of videos, we're going to be talking about basis functions. Now, uh, in the last set of videos, when we set up our general program, we talked about how we were going to create, be creating several matrices, and each element in the matrix uh, would actually be an integral over all space of some basis function times an operator times another basis function, okay? Uh, and so one might ask why you would choose one set of basis functions over another set of basis functions. And the way that we choose our basis functions comes down to how we can evaluate integrals on a computer. If I have some function on a computer, and we'll say that this is f of r, there are two ways that I can take an integral over this function. The first is that I can create a finite grid and I can evaluate the function at each point along the grid and make a Riemann sum where I take the value at a point times the width of this to as an estimate of the area. And if I make the points close together, I can effectively get the area under the curve. So in order to do that, I need to not only know what my function is, they need to evaluate it at many different points and then sum all of those points up. The second way that I can take an integral on a computer is that I can take a function where I know what the antiderivative is and then I can just evaluate the antiderivative at both endpoints. So here I only have to evaluate a function twice but I need to know what the antiderivative of the function I'm trying to evaluate is. This is much easier to implement and is much faster to implement. Uh, however, we need to have a function where we know how to calculate this. We need to already basically know the answer for the integral. And this is where Gaussian functions come into play. All of the integrals that we're going to be looking at are an integral over all space. And if we look at a one-dimensional Gaussian, the integral over a one-dimensional Gaussian raised to some exponent alpha is equal to the square root of pi over alpha. And our three-dimensional Gaussians, we're going to be able to separate into a Gaussian of x, y, and z. And so the total integral over all space would be equal to pi over a, or pi over alpha to the three halves power. And we can do this really um, pretty trivially. And our ability to evaluate these integrals by, by knowing this theorem uh, is why we use Gaussian functions for electronic structure theories. Just because we can do these, these integrals and evaluate the matrix elements uh, as rapidly as possible. Um, so if we're using these as our basis functions, it's pretty reasonable to ask how well do they approximate actual uh, electronic wave functions? And the answer is eh, so-so. Um, so we know from solving the hydrogen atom that a single electron orbital uh, should at decay away from the nucleus with some sort of exponential function. So here what I've done is uh, drawn the radial portion of the carbon 1s orbital. Uh, and it has some function that's normalized e to the minus lambda r, where lambda would be some decay length. If we fit this to a single Gaussian function, we get something that looks quite different. So orange is the best fit Gaussian. Uh, to this exponential. <clears throat> and we notice that it's it's rounded up here. It doesn't capture the electron wave electronic wave function near the nucleus. It's not peaked like it should be. And it decays too quickly in the long in the long distance part. So it doesn't really give us the right behavior. So doing a Gaussian as our orbital might allow us to calculate things swiftly, but maybe not so accurately. The way that we actually do calculations is for a given basis function, we make it be the sum of multiple Gaussians. So in orange is the best fit to a single Gaussian. In lighter orange or yellowish is if we take six Gaussians together and we add them up and call that one basis function, we get something that decays a little bit more closely to the actual 1s function. Uh, it's a little bit more peaked. It's still slightly rounded. We can make this more peaked by adding more Gaussian functions. Uh, but at some point, we have to make a compromise between uh, um, 
accuracy, and speed. And so we're going to use six Gaussian functions for a 1s orbital. And the percentage, or the uh, percentage of each Gaussian that we're going to add is fixed. So whenever we talk about this particular basis function, we would have a fixed value, the c sub i, that would be fixed for each one of these individual Gaussians. Okay? And we call the c sub i the degree of contraction. The alpha sub i is the exponent. And n sub i is the normalization, so that uh, if we didn't have the c sub i here, and we integrated this uh, n sub i e to the minus alpha i sub i r squared over all space, that this would be 1. So this n makes us normalized, uh, and the c sub i is relative to a normalized Gaussian. Okay, And this is, what, this is the type of basis function that we're going to use. And we're going to have some number of these basis functions. Uh, for each atom that we want to look at, okay? Uh, so when we think about our entire basis set that we're going to use, we're going to have a number of basis functions for each atom, and each basis function can comprise multiple Gaussian functions inside it. And so to represent that on a computer, we're going to construct an array which technically it's going to be a cell array structure in MATLAB, of nb, which is the number of basis functions. And the ith, we're going to call that, that basis. And the ith value of basis needs to contain a number of different pieces of information. We need to have the number of primitive Gaussians that we're going to use, and this might vary uh, depending on what atom we have. For example, we're going to use more Gaussians to describe carbon than we would to describe hydrogen. Uh, it might vary based on um, what the range of the exponents is. For example, we might need to use fewer Gaussians to describe a 3s orbital than we do a 1s orbital, which is tightly peaked. Um, for that given basis function, we also need to have an array that will have n number of elements that we're going to call c, and c sub n will be the contraction coefficient for the nth Gaussian. We also need to give it an array of Gaussian functions and each Gaussian function uh, is going to contain the center location, so its x, y, and z component, its exponent alpha, and its normalization constant n. And once we can construct uh, an array with all of this information, we'll have our entire basis set. And the way that we're going to get our c sub n's and our alpha sub n's uh, is that we're going to look them up. Many groups have done research on how to calculate, on how to create basis functions, and we're going to use a set of basis functions in this program called the 6-31G basis set, which is a basis set uh, from Popel and co-workers. Uh, and I'll, in the next video when we actually build them, I'll, I'll give you the reference for where we'll get those. Right? So join me for the next video when we'll actually implement this in programmatic form uh, in our MATLAB program. Thanks so much. Oh yeah, stop this, stop this.